Welcome everyone to Couch Potato Diary. Happy Thursday. My name is Peter Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Sorry, I forgot to turn the uh, the, the light on behind me. Um, oh, that's dark and ominous. All right, there we go. There we go. Um, coming up on the show today, a little bit more reaction to the Jacob Markstrom trade. Um, we, we did... I did kind of cover it for game over. Um, so if you are looking for uh, some more Jacob Markstrom content, that is where that would be. Uh, it was also available for podcast listeners on the Couch Potato Diary podcast feed, but just kind of a sober second thought on that. Uh, and then we get ready for the week in the CFL as we preview Thursday night football, give out some CFL power rankings for the week, and we'll wrap up with some boxing power rankings. So a lot to get to. Let's get to it and talk some hockey. Jacob Markstrom is now a member of the New Jersey Devils as he gets moved for a 2025 top 10 for, uh, protected first round pick and uh, defenseman Kevin Ball. Now, from a Flames standpoint, I don't think that they did all that bad here. You have a 34-year-old goalie. Goalies just don't go for a whole lot. Markstrom is a season removed from a putrid season, and he wanted to go to but one place, and that is New Jersey. And he had the power to control that, given his no trade. So, all of it kind of stacks up to be a very difficult spot for the Calgary Flames to be in. And so, I think Calgary did all right in this move, in in getting a first round pick and in going out and acquiring a young defenseman who can help build up some depth in the organization. Um, I was on Sportsnet 960 earlier today and GVP asked a, a pretty good question in terms of the timing of, of this whole thing. Um, and I do think that making this move now, just so you know what assets you have in the chamber, if you want to try to move up in the first round, if you want to try to move whether it's moving up from nine into the, the top five, which I think will be very difficult, or moving up from the Vancouver spot into a, a, a spot in the middle rounds and moving things that way, I do think that there is a, a little bit there that you can you can do now with this New Jersey Devils pick. The Flames have six picks in the first round in the next three years. I don't know if they make all of those. Uh, we will see, but I, I do wonder if they try to to kind of advance things here a little bit. So uh, again, like I said, I cover the flame stuff on the Game Over side. Um, check out Game Over Calgary and make sure you subscribe to that channel. Now, on the New Jersey front, I, I find this a really interesting move. I said last year, New Jersey gets a goalie, they're a cup contender. Now they have their goalie, and I think you have to view this team as a, uh, as one that can make some noise in the Eastern Conference. I do still think they're a defenseman away now from really being able to, to go out and make some noise. But when you look at this, you have now gone out and addressed your biggest need. And you still have probably your best trade chip available at number 10. Um, I, I, I just wonder what the Devils do. I would be stupid. Stunned if New Jersey used that 10th overall pick. Um, I think they try to go out and make a real impact move, probably on that blue line, use that 10th pick to go out and get somebody and really make a push at this. I think the Devils are an incredibly interesting team. I think they have a lot of young skill at forward. I think they have a pretty solid blue line, just again, maybe one piece away and some depth. Um, and if Jacob Markstrom is that guy from a season ago, then this team can make some real noise. If he isn't, this is a big problem for for New Jersey um, because th they, this is kind of all of their chips in on, on Jacob Markstrom at this key development time for this franchise. And so I think this is the right move. I think it's a move that has a high probability of working, but if it doesn't, Whew, are they fucked? Um, on the uh, speaking of fucked, on the NHL trade front, we also saw a deal yesterday. Pierre Luc Dubois on his way to the Washington Capitals in exchange for Darcy Kemper. The trade is one for one. I hate this for Washington. I know their goal the next couple of seasons is to get Alex Ovechkin that goal scoring record. I don't think Pierre Luc Dubois is the guy to help with that. I think that he was absolutely a liability for the LA Kings in the Stanley Cup playoffs and throughout the regular season. This is a guy who was maxed out at 60 points and one would assume that his defensive work would help kind of offset some of that, but he was taking atrocious penalties for the LA Kings last season. And I, he was, I think, in a very significant way, more of a liability than an asset to the, this LA Kings squad. And now to bring him into a Washington team that was just starting to get some things going with the, the, the young kids. Like their, their talent level isn't high enough. But getting that dude in there, 
I don't think helps. Like, I, I think that he is really someone who, given his contract and given... <laughs> given how much you have to play him to justify that, and given how poorly he then plays in those minutes, I think he is someone who has the potential to set a franchise back. And so, that this is a really, really bad move if you're Washington. If you're the Kings, this gets interesting now. They needed to improve in goaltending. I... Don't know if Kemper is an upgrade over Talbot necessarily, but it's it's at least different and kind of moving the pieces around a little bit. They have a lot of cap space to play with. Now they have a lot of guys who they need to resign or at least a lot of spots that they need to fill, but they have a, a good young team in LA. What's been obvious over the last couple of seasons is that they aren't good enough, um, that they aren't on the Oilers level, as has been made very clear in back-to-back -back playoff series. I don't think they're at Vancouver's level. I don't think they are where the Vegas Golden Knights are. So they need to go out and, I think, make a push. And uh, they tried to do that with Pierre-Luc Dubois. It didn't work. But now they have another chance to go out and maybe get a difference maker or two and and try to, to elevate this thing that way. So the Kings, I think, a little bit interesting now that they've freed up at least a little bit of space and mixed things around between the pipes. It is uh, Thursday, so that means the Canadian Football League kicks off tonight. Let's get into it and talk some football. <laughs> It is week number three in the Canadian Football League, and it starts tonight with Montreal taking on Ottawa. By the way, um, this week was my first week, and it's going to be a weekly thing now, doing the uh, picks and predictions um, piece up on 3 Down Nation. It is uh, best bets for some of these games. Um, this week, I, I ran through all of them. Uh, that That is not necessarily going to be the case um, in, in weeks gone by, but I, I thought to, to kick off the, the thing this week, uh, we, we would do all, all four games. So uh, if you want some more thoughts on that, head to 3 Down Nation right now. It is the, uh, the predictions column. Um, just search for me. Let's get to Thursday. Um, it is Ottawa taking on Montreal. I, I think Ottawa, I've said before, Ottawa is improved. Um, th this is a really tough start, and the fact that they're going to be able to go one and one out of a, a Winnipeg-Montreal gauntlet to start things off is really impressive. And, uh, like, Drew Brown showed me everything I wanted to see. He can make all the throws, stares his receivers down a little bit, um, and... It's some accuracy issues, but I do think those are things that can come. He obviously has, uh, very cliche, but he has the arm talent, he has the mobility, there's a lot to work with there, and he has some pretty good receiving weapons out there in Ottawa. Now, we didn't even see Rhymes really step up all that much in week one, but this is a different animal with Montreal, and the thing that gives me the most pause about, um, about Ottawa this week is how Montreal is able to disguise what they are doing. They disguise their pressures really, really well, and that really gave McLeod Bethel Thompson, uh, some fits. And this is a vet, and they say it on the broadcasts ad nauseum. This is a guy who's seen everything. Well, Drew Brown hasn't as a starter. And so I think that this pressure is going to really give him some fits and really give him some issues. This is a very, very good Montreal team. Um, and it's, it's a good Ottawa team. I just think, like, the, the whole uh, styles make fights thing, this is a bad style matchup for, for, for Ottawa. Because defensively, I think they can do a lot that is going to cause some mayhem for Ottawa. And offensively, this team fits exactly into the spot that I think Ottawa's defense struggles in. They put on a, a good show against Winnipeg. I do think a lot of that was Winnipeg's offensive struggles. But they, they do put on a... They, they, they put on... Um, that they put on a pretty good performance, except they still got beat in the deep passing game a couple of times. This is where you could expose Ottawa a season ago. Cody Fajardo is more than comfortable launching that football around. And so I think that his want and desire to push the ball deep downfield is going to be met by Ottawa's lack of ability to uh, defend that. So that that's why I like Montreal in this spot here. I, I got the Owls winning this one and covering minus six and a half. Uh, I give another play on the three down site. So go check that out right now. Um, both those teams are... Uh, I was going to say in the top half, that's actually not exactly exactly, exactly accurate, uh, but um, Montreal was at the top of the power rankings after week one. Guess where they are after week two? Let's talk about it with this week's CFL Power Rankings. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, a little bit later than normal heading into uh, a CFL week with our power rankings, but still thought I'd get them out for you guys this week. Coming in at number nine, it is still the Hamilton Tiger Cats. A much better performance in week one, and uh, in week two than in week one, I think, uh, against Saskatchewan. It felt like they had this game won right up until they didn't. Um... Bo Levi Mitchell has played significantly better than I thought he would. I, I will I will wave the flag on that one. I don't know if he can do it for 18 weeks, but for two, he's looked pretty good. But this team has still dropped a couple of tough ones, and I, I still have concerns about them going forward. At eight, it is Edmonton. Uh, again, a team that has dropped a couple of tough ones late. And they have played really well through three quarters in both of their games. But the fourth quarter has been an issue for this group, and now they have a couple of road games coming up. I would not be surprised if they end up at the bottom of this sooner rather than later, even though I do kind of like this team. Uh, coming in at seven, it's Winnipeg. You cannot ignore the issues that this team has had. Um, like, that, they are just, they are staring you right in the face now. Caleros has struggled in two weeks. The offensive line is not protecting very well. The defense is getting pressure, but they're not finishing drives. That This is... This is a problem in Winnipeg now, and we will see if they can course correct coming up this week. In at number six, I have the Calgary Stampeders uh, coming off of... Um a win out there against Hamilton out in week one. This is a team that's impressed um, so far this season. And so I, I I like them to continue to impress moving forward, even in a loss uh, against BC. There, there were some things that I, I didn't mind about this group. At five, it is Ottawa. that uh, They have played just one game. Um, and given how the, the teams ahead of them have played, this is more, them being at five is more a statement of the teams ahead of them than the, the teams, um, than, than where they are at. Coming in at number four, I have the BC. Lions. Uh, they get right against Calgary. The, the defense looked pretty good offensively. Um, they had some issues initially with the blitzes that Calgary was throwing at them, but then eventually you do that over and over and over again. Vernon Adams is going to figure it out. So I I, I like BC uh, to, to continue to move up. At three, I have Saskatchewan. 2-0, and first place in the West Division. Um, but it, 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 like, a lot of things are going right. They still need to figure out the penalties. They still need to figure out the defense a little bit. I think that'll come. Um, and they still need AJ Ouellette to get going. But to have those issues to improve upon and to be 2-0... Not a bad spot to, to, to be in. They aren't on Toronto's level, though. That Toronto defense really impressed me, even in giving up so many points against BC in Week 1. Um, I think that this defense is going to have a field day against Edmonton coming up in Week 2, and we'll see if the offense can continue the momentum they had coming off of Week number 1. And at number 1, it is still the Montreal Alouettes. Um, there's just that there is no denying that they are the best team in the league right now. Their defense is playing exceptional. Cody Fajardo um, still makes some Saskatchewan Cody Fajardo type of mistakes, but um, is still also playing like a Grey Cup champion. So um, th th this team is the, the more complete team in the CFL right now. And thus, they are our number one pick uh, for CFL power rankings this week. But we're not done listing things yet. Um, Tank Davis coming off of an impressive win uh, last Saturday at the MGM Grand Garden Arena. Did that help him move up in the pound for pound rankings? Let's look at the new boxing pound for pound list. All right, Tank Davis coming off of a big win over Frank Martin, plus David Benavidez with a win at 175 pounds. How does this affect the boxing pound for pound? Let's Talk about it. Coming in at number 10, it is Teofimo Lopez. Um, I He was at number 10 before, and nothing, no one has done anything, I think, to jump up and, and knock him down. Coming in at number 9, I couldn't get Benavidez any higher. It, it was a win. It wasn't a, a, an overly impactful win. He is still waiting and hoping that he gets about with Canelo Alvarez. I, I just, I couldn't move him up, because one step ahead of him is Errol Spence Jr., and I, I just don't think I can drop um, Errol Spence Jr., one notch below right now. So uh, Spence Jr. stays at eight. I did move down Dimitri Bivol and Artur Beterbiev. One of those guys might drop out of the top 10 um, or, or down to 10 probably given uh, that their fight, I believe that's scheduled for October. Um, but both of those fighters moved down a, a spot just for, for some inactivity and because Tank Davis looked so good. He gets into the pound for pound top five with his win over Frank Martin. That power is game changing. Um, and now the, 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 the fights that he has been mentioned in, and we'll talk about fights to make coming up on Friday, but the fights that he's been mentioned in, Lomachenko and uh, potentially Shakur Stevenson, that can help him move up the, the pound for pound rankings even more. At number four, it is Canelo Alvarez. We'll see what the next fight has in store 
for him. Um, but coming off of uh, a couple of pretty good performances in a row, Canelo staying in that top four spot, given all he has done. A, a little bit of that is certainly um, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, but he, he's still putting up some good fights against good fighters among a number of different weight classes. At three, it is Alexander Usyk. Uh, he stays at number three after a, a victory over Tyson Fury uh, as he unifies the heavyweight championship after winning at cruiserweight as well. Coming in at two, Terrence Crawford. I, you, you just, you can't knock that win over Errol Spence Jr. And you can make every argument that he is the number one pound for pound fighter in the world. I still have Naoya Inoue at number one. Um, what he is able to do among a number of different smaller weight classes, the power that he has, and just how destructive he is. I just, I have to keep him at number one. Those are your new boxing power rankings. And that is today's show. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, remember, Flames Breakdown was over on Game Over Calgary's YouTube channel or on the Couch Potato Diary podcast. Uh, that one came out yesterday. Coming up tomorrow, it's a Fights in Football Friday, so we are going to look at all the wildness in the WWE right now, plus some WWE TNA talk um, as I figure out what would their Forbidden Door show look like. We also um, have boxing fights to make coming off of a big weekend last weekend. And in the football portion, we'll look at what happens tonight in Thursday Night Football and get ready for the weekend ahead in the Canadian Football League. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Follow me on social media. I'm at Primetime Klein, and I'll talk to you all later. I'm out. <music>